A very good evening and welcome to another episode of South Africa Today and Beyond. I'm quite excited today in the studio. I'm joined by Lebaha Mashile. She's a performer, an entertainer, a poet, a writer, published books. I mean, you do a lot of things. I do a lot of different welcome things. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I'm really excited and we've been, we've been struggling to get you on the show. So finally, and this is the season finale, I'm so glad that you are closing off our season this year. No, I'm honored to be here on your season finale. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, you do a lot of things, but also maybe let's just go through your history. Yeah. Uh, you're born in exile in the States. Uh, maybe let's take us through your, maybe your journey and coming to South Africa eventually. My parents are both from Johannesburg. They both grew up in Joburg. Uh, my dad in Western Native Township, which was Westbury, but then his family was relocated to Soweto. My mother was born in Sophia Town. Her family was relocated to Dube, also Soweto. Um, they, they left South Africa as students. My father wanted to study engineering, you know, and couldn't do it in, in South Africa, so he left. Uh, in the late 60s. My mother left in the 70s. She was a student activist during the 1976 riots, you know. She was studying at Teflo, at University of the North. She was doing law. And that's the hub of the, you know, uh, the That's where a lot of, show. yeah, and people don't get the sense that, you know, when you, learn, when you hear the history and the branding of 1976 is so much about Soweto, but actually the riots disrupted studies all over the country, you know. So my mother had the choice between kind of staying and going to jail or leaving, and she left. Um, they met in the U.S., started a family, um, I made the great trek back to South Africa as a toddler to stay with my grandparents so that my parents could finish their studies and, you know, have some, try to get some stability, I guess, as immigrants, exiles living in America. Went back to the U.S., did the bulk of my schooling, their primary school, half of high school. My family started transitioning back in the 90s. We moved back officially 1995. I was 16 years old. I finished high school here, went to university here. Um, really discovered my artistic voice here. I've always been a lover of books and literature, didn't really understand, you know, how to build an artistic life. I never thought that that was going to be something that was available to me. So I studied law at WITS. And then while I was finishing my undergraduate, you know, I got hit by the poetry bug, fell in love with the underground art scene in Johannesburg, which was really amazing in the late 90s, early 2000s. There were lots of live spaces, um, live art, uh, really interesting electro music music, you know, you could go out every single night of the week and see a different kind of live art, alternative spaces, you know, and I guess that was, that was the vibe of the country, Johannesburg at least, you know, kind of post-revolution, you know, the society in transition, so I really fell in love with that as a young person um, and, and fell in love with seeing poetry being performed. I didn't think that that was something that could be done, you know, and I worked up the courage to do it and haven't stopped. Oh man, it's a lot. I mean, look, art as a career, art as a way of paying the bills, you know? Yeah. I mean, if you talk about within African society, it's... Uh, if Frowned you, if up you, Absolutely. You tell your mother, uh, I want to be an artist. Oh, like, you want to draw for a living, you know? You want to paint for a living. What is that, you know? But how, what are some of the challenges that, you know, artists in South Africa interface with? Oh, God. Within the art space. You make me laugh, you know? I'm thinking about... <laughs> Raroni Mamwepa once said to me when he was still at the Department of uh, International Affairs, I wonder if he's still there. Anyway, he said, since I'm not at a station, like, do you still do recitals? Like, is that, you know, at a station? I was like, wow, that's my job. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, when I started out, my, my, my fear certainly was going down the trajectory of a lot of South African artists, you know, because there is no support system, because there is no, you know, institutional support, because there is no protection of intellectual property, because there is a devaluation of creative labor, because there is a devaluation of just what arts and culture mean in a society, you know, um, you know, the artist as, as a human being kind of takes the brunt of all of that, right? Um, and then if you're lucky, you get kind of fame as a reward, right? Or if you're lucky, you know, if you're really, really lucky, you get longevity. But the people who get longevity are the people who really fight for it, you know? Early in my career, I remember Don Laka saying, there's the show and there's the business, you know? So the show is about the artist, you know? And the artist's mind is really creative, is, is, is like a child, right? Uh, but the business is where you have to be a grown up. And the business is where you have to understand that you're dealing with an industry that is not interested in your health health, your well-being, your wealth, or your survival. In fact, its, it's survival and growth is really at your expense, and you have to kind of understand that. So I spent my 20s 
um, really fighting, trying to figure out how to how to resist, you know, this this nasty trajectory that so many creative people have gone through. You know, I didn't want my mother to be sitting at baseline with a hat in her hand and people throwing coins sure. in it to bury me. You know what I mean? I, I didn't want that life. Um, I realized very early on that I've got a gift with language and I've got an ability to connect with people. So how can I take these things and multiply them? You know, I'm lucky in the sense that everybody who knows me, everybody who's aware of my name knows that I'm a poet, you know, but I have to take these things and figure out how to multiply them and earn a living. So I do, I, I MC, I speak, I facilitate workshops, I perform, I act, um, I write, I do a lot of traveling. Um, I, I do what it is that I have to do to push the limits of my gifts and my talent, to push my skill set, um, and to, and to feed my family. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm 37 years old. I've been on stage for 16 years. It's like, a long time. It's a very long time. I'm very, 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 very lucky. But it's still, it's still a struggle, you know? I still get calls up to today of people phoning me and wanting me to work for free, not understanding that what I do is labor, you know? Mm. Um, but, but I also get really amazing opportunities as well. As I get older, the more I'm, re I'm realizing more and more that if you, if you want to be the kind of artist that honors your purpose, you know, uh, you have to accept the fact that no one is going to hand you the work that you need to do. You know what I mean? Like there'll always be the jobs that I have to do to be able to pay the bills, but nobody's going to hand me the work that's going to build my legacy. That's the work that I have to do on my own. You know, that's the work that I have to prioritize. So as much as, you know, you're lucky as an artist in South Africa, if you can survive and pay the bills, you know, if you're only preoccupied with surviving and paying the bills, that also is at the expense of your creativity and your vision, you know? So you have to figure out how to do both at the same time, you know, and have a fan family and be a human being and take care of your health <laughs> and 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 very important yes. and earlier we were talking about your involvement currently with the departments of arts and culture and developing sort of a cultural policy for government that speaks to institutional support for artists maybe just explain to our viewers what that process is like so this is th this was very exciting um i've been working with the department of arts and culture as a part of a reference panel that has been working on drafting a new white paper for the department of arts and culture so uh, 20 years ago, you know, early on in our democracy, the first white paper, which was the first policy paper for the Department of Arts and Culture, the paper that decides the governing framework, you know, the institutions that the Department of Arts and Culture will 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 build, will fund, um, the major ways in which artists can be able to access support are enshrined in the white paper. So 20 years later, uh, government has decided to do a review of this paper. And I was really lucky to serve on a panel with a lot of very very experienced and very intelligent people, professors like Andres Oliphant, uh, Moshe Kondo, Avril Joffe. I spent the better part of this year crisscrossing the country with them and interacting with artists across various sectors, writers, photographers, um, practitioners of indigenous knowledge systems, custodians of heritage, because now uh, heritage is being incorporated as a core part of the Department of Arts and Culture, which is seen as a major oversight, you know, that the department um, unfortunately made very early on in our democracy, but now it's being included squarely inside the Department of Arts and Culture, which is amazing. So I talked to heritage uh, custodians, people who uh, crafters, uh, filmmakers, performers, uh, d d d just across the gamut. And it was amazing because I realized that the bulk of creatives in South Africa are not interested in the things people would expect creative people to be interested in, like fame or, you know, or like huge, massive wealth, which is great if you can get it. I also want it. But, you know, most people just want to survive. Most people just want to be able to put bread on the table and want to be able to make their art. They just want the support to be able to put the messages out there that they need to put out there you know um it was also enlightening because you know i get i think artists get um labeled as being very dependent we're always looking for handouts we're always you know we're, we're always dysfunctional um and i met a lot of people who are very meticulous in what they do who have built systems for themselves where there are none mm -hmm. i met a lot of people who really just want the space to be able to create you know that's all they want and and to not have government tell them what to say so this process has made me very proud to be an artist in south africa um the second the white trip 
paper is now uh, in its second draft. We just had an Indaba last week sharing the white paper with the arts community, but there'll be more uh, media awareness being made about this white paper. There'll be more interviews, there'll be more opportunities for people to interact with it, you know? Um, it's important that everybody in the creative sectors reads the white paper um, because there's some fundamental changes that are being made, you know, to, to the, our institutions in the arts sector. Um, but I mean, overall, you know, at my age to have had the experiences that I've had, you know, um, I feel I feel really blessed, you know. I think it's also important for creatives to get involved in understanding how policy is made, you know. That shouldn't just be the work of academics because ultimately this policy affects us, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's important for artists, for people who are involved in the creative sector, be in the room, you know, read the stuff because this is gonna, this is gonna have a day, an impact on your day-to-day -day life how you live and how you work. I mean, when you talk about heritage, you talk about culture, and I think this is what happens, you know, during 24th of September, Heritage Day, people think that, you know, culture, heritage includes just dressing up in your... And I think <laughs> it's... It, to some extent, I mean, it's a bit offensive, you know, that it, it, it transcends beyond that. It is. And those of you within the cultural space, and I think you have a deeper appreciation of what, when you talk about culture, and when you're talking about and incorporate, incorporating within the heritage space, and institutionalizing, you know, all of that, the history of this country. Mm. But I'm, I'm, I, I'm just wondering, I mean, the, the, you talk about arts within, this, I mean, the spectrum, you know, crafters, your poetry, uh, storytellers, you name it. I mean, it, it would have not been an easy task. But I want us to go off an ad break. When we come back, I want to just take us through the process. It would have not been easy to engage with people from different sectors within the art space. Yeah. So when we come back from the ad break, I want us to deal with some of those complexities that you went through when drafting this white paper. So let's go for a quick ad break and we'll take it from there when we come back. Welcome from the ad break and in studio we're still joined by Osnon Tlantla from Sonke Gender Justice and we're talking about the Safe Ride campaign that was launched by uh, Sonke Gender Justice last year. But maybe take us through the launch, I mean, which areas have you covered as an organization in terms of rolling out the campaign? Um, as I said, that the launch uh, happened here in Gauteng at uh, Bri Takes Rank. And, but also after the launch, we started engaging with the local um, taxi ranks and the taxi drivers at the local level. We had dialogues around Ivory Park, um, Tembisa, Kempton Park, and the dialogues were around how can men prevent gender-based violence. And as taxi drivers, we know that the taxi industry is predominantly um, uh, occupied by men. So we, we had those kind of, 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 of workshops with them and dialogues, but also so the kind of dialogues that we have, they include the commuters, which are women, so that they could also be able to, you know, talk to the taxi drivers and really relate their stories to the taxi drivers and how much impact does that have in their lives. And I think, you know, we're really getting a very positive um, response from taxi drivers because some of them have joined us as our community action teams, as people who are going to be responsible in terms of really talking to other taxi drivers and also, you know, being able to take stories of um, the commuters and assist in terms of reporting those cases. And also what I would like to highlight with this project is that we provide taxi drivers with information in terms of when they are coming across the um, incidences where women are being raped or need assistance, where can they really refer women to? Then cases like the Tutuzela Care Centers. We know that here in South Africa we've got 51 Tutuzela Care Centers, which are the one-stop facilities for rape survivors. So we, we really inform them uh, around that. But we also, you know, provide information to the very same commuters in terms of where can they report the cases and what are their rights? because most of the time they're being taken advantage of because people think that they don't know their rights and even if they do know their rights but they don't know where to report. So those are the kind of, of things that we did. And you know in terms of the program being visible in the communities we developed stickers. We know that most of our taxis have stickers that you know are very uh, rude in terms of the language and the language that has been used against women but now we develop taxi stickers that have very positive messages that that, you know, encourage men to stand against gender-based violence. We also developed like your license um, stickers as well. So that have that kind of, of, of messages. So we, we're really looking forward to see the change within the tech industry. 
Um, we have taxi drivers who say to us, who do you think you are? What do you think you're doing? Do you think you can change us? You know, but we, we like to have that kind of response so that we can know who we're dealing with and how can we engage. And through our dialogues, we're creating that space to say, you know, talk to us, let us hear what is happening and let us work together in terms of being able to change the situation. Because we always remind them that the very same person who is in your taxi, it could be your own sister, it could be your own mother or your own child. So whatever that you do to this person, you must know very well that it might happen to your own a relative, whether it's in this province or in any other province. So, you know, we try to also bring it very close to home so that they could understand that gender-based violence in this country is a serious challenge. Absolutely. And I think also, also in terms of like uh, government's response to this particular campaign, I mean, we hear of cases where people would want to, as part, in particular women, you know, with the good police stations and want to report um, issues around gender-based violence, in particular rape. And I mean, the response and the reaction from, you know, those who are meant to protect and serve, you know, is not what we would want it to be. What has been the response and I think maybe the level of cooperation from government, especially the South African Police Service? Um, in terms of this campaign, we we still getting very um, poor response from the SAPS. And it is true what you're saying to say women still don't want to go and report the cases because they are scared of being secondary victimized by the, the SAPS officials. But, you know, we through the Tutuzela Care Centers, we've got uh, SAPS officials who are specially trained to deal with gender-based violence issues and domestic violence issues. That is why we always encourage people to go and report these cases directly to Tutuzela Care Centers. But also in, in, in the uh, our police stations, we have what is uh, we call the victim empowerment offices. So if you are experiencing some kind of violence or domestic violence, we just encourage you not to go anywhere, but ask for a victim empowerment office in your nearest police station. But if you are closer to a Tutuzela Care Center, which is closer to, which is based in the um, public hospital, for instance, if I can just make an example, like in Paraguanath, there is one, in Tembisa Hospital, there is one. So people could go there directly and request to be um, serviced at the Tutuzela Care Center rather than in other place. But also in areas where there are no Tutuzela centers and people are very far from the police stations, there are NGOs around the areas who also assist in terms of these issues like we've got power that is you know also attending to issues around gender-based violence and i suppose also people can reach out to Swanke gender justice and they can point them in the right direction in terms of who to speak to yes they can do that and also they can go to our website we've got you know information of like the whole the tutuzela care centers around the country and also some other organization who provide services around gender-based violence prevention sure and i mean beyond just the taxi industry and it's a conversation we're having earlier around the fact that you know it's really just a microcosm of society what we see within the taxi industry is a reflection of what a bigger problem in society and within the parameters of what Sonke just, just Sonke gender justice does what are some of the other issues you know that perpetuate gender violence within the family as an institution as well but also within other social institutions as well be it I don't know you know um, even within media you know the kind of language that you're talking about earlier on you know the use of language you know the kind of you know medium that we see in terms of like the music videos you know the, that that sort of thing how has that contributed if anything you know, to the way in which, um, I mean, to, to gender-based violence, you know, and the perpetuation thereof? Um, you know, we usually talk about issues of corporal punishment, and we believe very strongly, as Sonke, to say, corporal, corporal punishment is not acceptable, it's wrong, it's something that is not supposed to happen, because as parents, we're teaching our children to deal with challenges in life using violence. And we think it is good to be the child, but you are teaching this child a mechanism of how to deal with issues. And that's out of the family setup. It's seen as something that is normal, mm. something that is acceptable. So we normalize violence. We normalize sure. violence, yes. And at the end of the day, there was a story of a young uh, child who has beaten his friend to death with a stick. It was in the media. And for me, it was saying this is the reflection of what this child knows how to deal with problems. And then we see that in the family, uh, in the family setup, we see that in our communities, we see that in schools, we see that in churches, where most of the churches or maybe religious um, groups would would really um, say corporal punishment is fine. But that is the foundation 
of the kind of the society that we are seeing. And we need to come back to our senses and say, what can we do about this? Don't we, if really parents don't have a way of really engaging with children, we need to go seek help and say, how can we deal with this issue? Because we're now bringing up kids who would only understand that the only way I can deal with violence, uh, with, with challenges in life, it's using violence. And then when we talk about um, domestic violence, it's okay. When we talk about assault, it's okay. But when children start reporting violence against them, then we say they are being disobedient. It's something that they're not supposed to do. Children are also human beings. Sure, man. That's interesting because, I mean, the socialization process, and I think mainly from the family as an institution, you know, that is really the, the most basic unit of socialization in the space. And what you're saying is quite powerful that, you know, we normalize violence. And it's certainly done because you grow up, you know, thinking that this is a way for conflict resolution, you know. Um, that, you know that, I think that's quite powerful. Mm -hmm. But I think Osman Tante as well, let's talk about, I mean, substance abuse as well, um, in instances where that also is part of the problem. Uh, around issues of gender-based violence. In some of the case studies that you guys uh, have done and some of the, you know, your community outreach programs that you've done, how has that contributed as well to gender-based violence? There is a study that it's um, done by uh, VETS in partnership with Sonke in Deep Slot. It shows that um, alcohol abuse does contribute towards the high rate that we have of gender-based violence and that's another issue that we have. We know that if you Google uh, around issues of abuse of alcohol, South Africa we are the highest and it is a challenge that we are faced with, a challenge that we need to really deal with it because we cannot deal with gender-based violence and ignore the issue of alcohol abuse. So we need to be able to say, even in those spaces, as Sonke, we do uh, what we call tavern interventions. We talk to men around issues of gender-based violence, but also while they're in a tavern and drinking the alcohol, we need to be able to show the impact that alcohol abuse has in our communities. And we know in our day-to-day -day life, we grew up in the township where you know that the father next door when he is drunk, that is when he finds the strength mm. to be able to show off and beat the woman, kick the children, and we cannot ignore that and say it's not happening. The reality is we have cases. I think 90% um, of South Africans could really say I've, I've witnessed such incidents where you see a man who, or a woman who is sober and behaving the other way around when they are not sober. A completely sober. different individual, yeah. Exactly. Sure, but this is interesting. Um, tavern interv um, activations. How do you navigate through such a space? I mean, on the one hand, people, you know, it's a social space. People are trying to sort of, if you want to call it that, having some downtime, drinking. But at the same time, there's an attempt to educate that kind of, kind of space and conscientize people. How has that experience been? I mean, that could be interesting. Sometimes it's a very challenging space and very unsafe space. But, you know, through the mechanisms that Sonke uses, it becomes a bit easy because we have what we call digital stories. So most of our taverns, they've got TVs. We play those digital stories and start engaging men and have a dialogue around the digital story. The very same video that I've talked about of a woman who was raped by a taxi driver. When you play those videos, people who are at taverns are also human beings. They can relate to the stories. And then we start engaging with them and say, this is the situation in our community. What do you think? And then they start, you know, talking while others are drinking. Some of them, they will even stop drinking and just concentrate on the issue because some of the stories are stories that they are experiencing within their family uh, setup. Sometimes the stories that maybe the friends or the relative has um, experienced. So we engage with at that level. And at the end of the day, we encourage them to continue to discuss these issues. We provide them with pamphlets, with the information to say they can still go back to their own families and talk about it the whole thing, you know. So, yeah, it's it is quite possible. interesting, but it's a quite interesting <laughs> space. I mean, a, a tavern yeah. activation, you don't think that, you know, a learning process could really, or a meaningful learning process could take place in such a space because, I mean, also because of the conditions that wine would find themselves in. I mean, people are intoxicated and mm -hmm. it's a different setup. I'm really fascinated by it. I really am. Yeah, you need also to be able to, you, you know, engage the tavern owners. They advise us to say, when can you come? When is the right, what is the right date or the right time to come? And then they will tell us, more especially when there are big games. You know, they sure. will tell us that the game will be starting at 3 p.m. So the people start coming in at about 12, 1 o'clock. They're still sober at that moment, you know, still fresh, still understanding uh, issues. So we start engaging them at that particular time. And yeah, 
then when it's about half past two, you just have to give them their way to continue and have <laughs> of fun. Of course, yeah. But Osman at least they have this fun really when they are stuff. But now, uh, what, is, what becomes the way forward? How do we begin a society to, to re-socialize, you know, in terms of the, uh, the way we, we've been socialized as, as communities, as societies, you know, in terms of conflict resolution through violence and these examples that you're making earlier on in terms of we see through learning, especially as young children, at school, corporal punishment, even at the home, you know, a form of disciplining a child, you want to whip the child, you know. How do you begin to, to re-educate, to relearn? But I think also what I was saying earlier, some of these social institutions, and you're saying the same thing as well, you know, uh, social institutions within, you know, religious, um, within the religious aspect as well, um, the family unit as well, you know, uh, as the means of socialization, but also media, you know, the way we, we talk about women, the way we talk about people, you know, um, you know, the way we objectify and think, you know, we, we you know, have authority over women's bodies, um, those kind of things. How do we begin, and in conclusion, how do we begin to relearn and re-educate the communities? Um, so okay, we have a program that we working specifically with community radio station, but also we work with other media, you know, uh, companies even outside South Africa. We provide trainings for um, media companies, and we engage them on this on how do they really relate stories around women. But also, you know, we 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 observe kind of uh, advert. His, um, adverts within the, the, that space where every time when something has to do with cleaning and cooking it has to be a woman and you know we try to engage the media companies around that to say the way we portray a woman in our communities is, is very important because you know if you teach young boys that they can go play and be dirty the only person who could make them to be clean it's it's a it's a woman and they can go out and play and then when they come back the only person who's going to save them a meal it's a woman then you know you show this young man that the only role that the woman is capable of of of, of doing it's just cooking and cleaning so that is very important but also going back to the family setup the way you engage to your boy child and your girl child it's very important because that's where issue of socialization starts how do you relate to a young to uh, to your girl child how do you relate to your uh, a boy child and how do you really engage them in terms of stuff that they need to be involved in you know when there's leadership role that needs to be played in the family do you really give that potion to the boy child or do you equally you know give these sure. guys that kind of a role to play so it's very important because sometimes we tend to think that people learn stuff from somewhere else they learn it from from the family uh, backgrounds. Thank you so much, Austin Tantler, for the contribution. I think we've learned quite a lot, and I think Sonke is doing really wonderful work. And I think those who are watching at home, I think you're more than welcome to go to the Sonke Gender Justice website and get more information about the work, the wonderful work that uh, Sonke is doing, but also around the Safe Ride campaign. That's all we have for you uh, this evening. Thank you so much for joining us on the show, and I, th I hope you can come back next time. Thank you so much. Uh, that's all we have for you. Have a good evening.